Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Pryweller, Director of Conference and Event Content for Plastics News. I want to welcome you to this webinar on overmolding for injection molding, presented by Fictive and organized by Plastics News. In this webinar, the injection molding experts at Fictive will highlight the benefits of overmolding and provide you with proven solutions to overcome common challenges. You'll learn great design tips for creating your best overmolded parts. Today's presenter is Kyle Adams, Technical Applications Engineer at Fictive. Kyle is an accomplished manufacturing expert with over 18 years of industry experience working with the injection molding process. During the course of the webinar, you can ask questions by opening the Q&A icon located at the bottom or the top of your computer screen and then typing in your question. Your question will be asked in the order that it is received after the presentation portion of the webinar is completed. With that, let me turn the presentation over to Kyle Adams of Fictive. Kyle, the floor is yours. I hey, appreciate it, Joe. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, hoping to, uh, to explain a good bit of what overmolding is so you guys can all learn a little bit of something from it. As Joe said, I've, uh, I've been in the manufacturing world for a little over 18 years, actually. Um, but of the last 10, 12 years, my main focus has actually been primarily in injection molding. So done, uh, done a little bit of everything from sales to uh, project management, as well as just some design review. So uh, looking forward to, to the time here we spend. So uh, quick agenda, what we plan on talking about uh, again. Brief overview of uh, what is overmolding, you know, when and, and why you would use overmolding in, in your application or maybe your next project. The benefits that would actually become or be from, from overmolding, uh, some common problems that uh, that is faced, as well as maybe the solutions to, to prevent those problems. Uh, we'll get into some design tips. And then as, as Joe alluded to, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So jump right into it and uh, talk about the, the, the basics, the basics of, uh, of, in, of overmolding and injection molding. So first thing I'd like for everyone to do, um, <clears throat> take a look around, uh, you know, your desk, your area, your, the room you're in. I'd love for you guys to uh, to try to find uh, a part, you know, something that's maybe been overmolded, um, something that's maybe been assembled uh, that has an overmold. And for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with what overmolding is, uh, this would be something like a, a soft rubber-like material uh, that's been placed, uh, again, installed, maybe uh, molded onto a rigid plastic. Um, you know, your your mouse, for instance, is a good example a handle of, of maybe a, a drill or something like that, uh, maybe a remote control. Um, but if you take a close look at it, you uh, you may be able to try to determine how it was produced. So um, I've got my cell phone case here and, and a lot of these cell phone cases do have that that outside rubber edge um, as, a, as a prime example of, of what an overmold is. You got a lot of buttons that you need to be pushing. So uh, cell phone case is a great example of, of what is an overmolded part. There are obviously a, a lot of things to consider when you are exploring, exploring overmolding, um, but just a, a quick explanation of what it is. Um, you would have one mold or one cavity that you would produce one plastic part of, and then you would actually have a second mold or again, second cavity that would allow for that overmold operation to be performed. <clears throat> you take that, uh, that initial part from mold one and use that in, uh, in the second mold. Uh, this process, you would have usually two different materials, maybe two distinct plastic parts or plastic materials that are, that are used um, with, again, the end result being one finished and, and or complete part. So again, uh, you look at that image to the right, you have, uh, you have one finished part, even though you have two different materials. So let's kind of get into, uh, into how it works. So there are a couple of different ways of, uh, of doing overmolding, but the most common way is, is kind of what I alluded to. It's, uh, it's two separate and unique tools that would need to be manufactured or, or produced. Uh, the first tool would be manufactured and, and it would be what you would consider the substrate part. Um, 
this would be typically made out of a rigid material. So uh, again, if you look at that image to the right, the, the green handle portion of it, that would be the, the substrate, that would be the rigid part. So that would be uh, the first mold. The second mold that would be produced or, or you would shoot the overmold portion, which again, uh, if we go back to that image of the right, that'd be that the black, uh, probably a little bit soft tactile rubber or uh, elastomeric type material. So uh, typical process, you, you mold that green, in this case, uh, rigid part, you would take that part out of the first mold. You would then take that part and you would install that or, or physically place that into your second mold. So uh, that needs to be held in place. And then when you shoot the second part, uh, meaning the overmolded, you would finish with, again, that one complete part. So you may be asking yourself, why? Why would I want to use overmolding? Or maybe even when would I use uh, overmolding? So, um, you know, kind of hoping to, to touch into that. But I, I do want to say that you shouldn't automatically assume that overmolding is going to be that solution that you're going to want or you're going to need for, for your next project. Yes, it may make it easier, but um, it is possible that overmolding just may not work for that project that you're working on, you know, for, for one reason or another. But what I do want to talk about are the situations where overmolding does, in fact, actually make sense. So take a look at a couple of these advantages uh, to overmolding, as, as well as a couple of examples. So I asked uh, a minute ago, look around the part, look around your house, look around your room, um, and find a couple of examples. Do me a favor, uh, post those in the chat. I'd love to see kind of what those examples are that, that you guys are able to find your desk, because... Uh, I'll be honest, there, there's certainly times when I look around and I go, man, where are those overmold parts? So I'd love to see what uh, what you guys came across that uh, that you have on your, your desk for overmold parts. Um, <clears throat> so again, let's uh, let's look at the why. Why would you use overmolding? Uh, biggest reason that uh, that you'd use overmolding really is is the simplification, or it really does simplify the overall product assembly process. So having having two pieces molded into one, yeah, certainly does reduce the the overall labor hours during the final assembly process of your product, which obviously that would then save cost. Uh, depending on that product being assembled, if you're able to reduce the number of uh, of workers or, or people who are currently needed to do that assembly, you know, to put those two pieces together, this would allow to, to put those resources, you know, those people doing that initial assembly into another portion of the assembly process. So I've, I've kind of come up with this hypothetical scenario um, to kind of think about that aspect of it. So if, uh, if you've currently got two pieces that are needing to be assembled and you've got one person that is uh, responsible for putting that assembly together, let's just say that it's taking that person 30 seconds, for instance, to uh, to, to put the pieces together uh, to give you, you know, your your one part that uh, is is the initial handle for your overmold assembly, for instance. So again, takes them 30 seconds. So that means they'd be able to put together about 120 or so assemblies per hour. So if if that person is getting paid, just say $15 or so an hour, that means that each of these assemblies that would cost just in labor hours about about 12 cents a little over 12 cents per assembly so that obviously you know in in theory you think man that really doesn't doesn't add up to a whole lot but in, in fact it does and in, in fact it 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 prevents that person from doing something else in that assembly process so you could actually take that person and plug them into another spot within the assembly process which would allow you to actually increase that daily output that you're trying to, to strive for. And again, if you're able to increase that, then uh, that'll come up with your, again, the, the throughput being increased, but also your overall cost savings. So again, that uh, it's, a, it's kind of a hypothetical situation, but it's something to, to consider. But, you know, the, these next ones uh, hopefully are, are a little bit easier to to digest and, uh, and, and to consider and think about. So, um, Again, other advantages that uh, the overmolding provides really is that material versatility. This would actually kind of give you the, the best of both worlds. And what I mean by that is you actually have the ability to 
achieve different material durometers or maybe even different color options that uh, that you're looking to go for with uh, with the appearance. So um, great example is is what's displayed on the screen there, this, this toothbrush. So um, as you see, the the handle of this toothbrush in particular has those two different colors. So you've got a, a blue section that is uh, it looks like overmolded onto that white section. And it, it kind of gives a, a nice aesthetic appearance. So, you know, the the great thing about this option here with these different color choices is that you're you're not stuck with that. You're you're not uh, you you're not having to run that exact color scheme in this situation for the entire product life. You you have the ability to to mix and match or or run some different color options and give give the consumer give the user kind of what they're wanting. So. Maybe you run, uh, you know, again, a, a seasonal change and you're running blue and then you change it up to yellow or green or orange. But, you know, really the the reality is the, the, the possibilities really are kind of endless. So a uh, couple of, of examples. The the reality is you you probably have, you know, parts that you use every day or maybe you have on a workbench or just do at your house that have been overmolded. And, you know, a lot of times like everything else, you, you don't even think about it. You don't, you don't consider that they've been overmolded until you actually kind of, you know, wake up and you go, Hey, look at that, that, that part's been overmolded. So kind of trying to give a, a couple examples that, uh, that you may have may or may not have considered, but you know, the biggest one that, that I think most people have would be tool handles. So if, uh, if you've got, screwdrivers or drills, things like that. Chances are those have, have been overmolded at some point. If uh, if you have uh, an electric uh, leaf blower, you know, for, for blowing leaves and grass, things like that at your house, uh, a lot of times the handles of those of those tools of those of those blowers have have performed some sort of overmold operation for for comfort for the user. Personal care products such as uh, toothbrushes, again, great example here, or or a hairbrush um, is another good good example of what this may be. Um, and then, of course, medical devices. So a lot of medical devices, you know, that are used in your surgical room have been overmolded. But I'm I'm also guessing that next time you you go into a doctor's office, uh, I kind of encourage you to look around and and see if there's a, anything else that uh, that you may see that has been overmolded. But I know at my house I've got one of those digital thermometers that uh, that has some overmolding that's been been done, um, but then even some of your your blood pressure monitors or blood sugar monitors things like that. So again, if you if you take a real close look, you'll you'll see a lot of those parts that have been overmolded. Something else to consider when you kind of look into the automotive portion, but it's it's not exclusive to automotive. Is a lot of times there's there's overmolded that is taking place that is um, not seen. It's, it's actually kind of under the hood or you know, maybe inside of an enclosure. But um, you know, the designer who, who worked that out uh, determined that the overmolding operation makes the most sense. So again, a lot of automotive uh, is, is using overmolding. Um, in, in fact, if you've ever gone out or if you maybe own uh, an electric vehicle, a lot of the handles of those charging ports of so those charging handles are, are overmolded or have been overmolded. Uh, sometimes there's that rubber grip to it or just overall parts have been assembled. The other uh, other thing you look around is a lot of the a lot of key fobs, you know, you, you have in your pocket, you know, unlocking the car, lock the car, there is uh, there's often some overmolding being done there. Um, but in addition to that, you know, just some armrest. Um, it, it's amazing when you get into it, just how many different parts um, have actually been overmolded for one reason or another. The last one there is the sporting goods industry. So, you know, there are a lot of times when you, when you look around and, and you think, oh, it's been overmolded when, you know, oftentimes, you know, it, it hasn't. But a couple of great examples of, uh, of overmolding in your, your, your sporting goods world is if anybody is, uh, has gone snorkeling or, or scuba diving, you know, they're, uh, you know the, the fins that you would put on your feet have often been overmolded as well as the mask you put on your face. You've got, uh, you know, kind of that soft, a uh, softer durometer elastomer that uh, makes contact with your skin or your face, but then it it then transitions into that um, you know that that hard kind of rigid plastic on the outside. Uh, 
some sunglasses. I'm not sure if, if yours, but a lot of those sunglasses do have, uh, you know, some of the arms that have some, you know, rubber that's been overmolded onto it again for comfort. And then uh, for any of you golfers out there, um, if you if you cheat and you use a, a range finder to, to determine how far you are from uh, from the hole, a lot of those range finders actually have been overmolded as well. So. Um, I was uh, I was hoping to to get some examples from you guys, but apparently uh, there's a there's an issue with uh, with chat. So, um, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to have that ability. But uh, again, I'm hoping at some point we'll get this chat fixed, so we'll be able to have uh, have some uh, examples that you guys have uh, have come across for uh, for those those examples you've come across. But oh, looks like we've got it fixed. So yeah, feel free to use that chat box. All right. So let's touch on some of those benefits. So there are obviously a lot of a lot of benefits to overmolding, um, but I I did want to touch on on just a few of those of those benefits. Um, generally speaking, when you combine those two materials into one finished product, it it does allow you for you know again greater kind of design flexibility. Uh, when it comes down to it, most of the parts that have been overmolded. You know that you come across that you're using that I've referenced are all kind of consumer based or consumer use products. So there aren't a whole lot of consumers that I'm aware of that would want a product that that doesn't look good or, or doesn't feel good when they use it. So uh, a simple overmolding portion of an assembly could actually give uh, a unique aesthetic appearance, but it also can provide that ergonomic feel that the product user is wanting when they actually pick that up. So. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to go buy something, if I'm going to go, uh, you know, again, I, I mentioned a, a leaf blower a minute ago. If I'm going to go buy a leaf blower, I want to be able to pick that up and I want that to feel good in my hand. And a lot of times that that elastomeric outside feel is uh, is kind of what's ideal. It's really what, you know, what sells it is that is that feel. So, again, the the ergonomic, the aesthetics, those are those play a, a pretty big role. Now, at the same time, if if you've ever walked down uh, down the aisle of any of your your local big box, you know, kind of hardware stores, um, again, you guys all know the aisle I'm talking about. It's usually right there in the center of the store. You know, they've got all the various brands of those of those tools out on display. You know, the the point is they they want you to pick that up. They want you to feel it. They want you to to kind of put in your hand and, and see kind of what it feels like. Because again, the designers they've they've spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, you may pick something up just to see kind of what it weighs, but chances are you don't remember what it weighs. Chances are you kind of remember what it feels like in your hand. And, you know, again, if it's something that doesn't feel good, you kind of put it down. But if, uh, if, that, if that shape or that strategically placed kind of rubber soft accent pieces um, at those specific locations, you know, make that product feel higher in, you know, chances are that's what you remember and that's what you're going to be able to, to pick up. Oh, so um, you see the the chat is definitely working now, which is good. But um, overmolding itself, um, it really isn't limited to to look and feel alone. Uh, this process can obviously provide and and improve just your overall product performance. And a lot of that comes through the the durability and strength that would originate from that substrate part. So. Uh, it can balance both that that comfort that I mentioned a minute ago, as well as the performance of uh, of the over molded material. Uh, it's possible that a lot of parts, you know, again, they have to withstand a drop test. You know, you need to be able to drop it from three feet, six feet, eight feet, whatever that whatever that drop test requirement is to to pass your your standard. And a lot of that a lot of that structural, you know, integrity comes from that substrate material. So, um, you know, again, if, if we kind of go back to that, that example of the, of the hardware tool or the leaf blower, um, if, if, if someone's got to drop that and it's got to withstand that drop, they want to pick it up obviously in one piece and, uh, and not have a problem. So, if if you've chosen the right material and you you've done the due diligence to make sure that you pick the right material from the from the get go, that that part will obviously withstand that drop test, which comes from that substrate, but again still has that comfort that comes from that overmolded elastomeric material. Um, 
kind of touched on this uh, this next bullet on the the previous slide. This was uh, <clears throat> you know the 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 assembly portion of it. So uh, overmolding can eliminate that need for secondary assembly or the the need for adhesives. Um, you know again some of those parts you you see maybe had uh, had an adhesive that needs to be applied to uh, to that soft grip. Um, the this this would eliminate that. You know this also would eliminate the the chance for human error during that process. So you combine all those advantages together, uh, the, the process can actually reduce the overall production cost associated with those uh, those additional handlings of uh, of those parts. So again, think about uh, that previous example of the the thirty second assembly. If uh, if during this initial assembly process someone was actually needing to install screws, say they needed to put two or three screws into that assembly to, to create that one part. And say that during that 30 second assembly, you know, the, the operator got rushed and they, they only put two of the three screws, or maybe they didn't get that, those screws tight. The, the chance of that grip coming loose kind of becomes, uh, becomes a problem. And if your user who's, who's using that leaf blower, that drill or whatever that product is, has to then deal with a, a loose grip or a loose handle that doesn't lend itself to a, a great uh, great product experience with uh, with that product. So, um, you know, again, this this would eliminate that human error aspect of it. So again, you you'd be opening a box and you'd have your part already already assembled together. All right, moving on. So the, the last thing that I want everyone to think is that overmolding really is, you know, perfect. It, it doesn't come with its its drawbacks. So, you know, what I'm hoping to touch on here are again some of those common problems, some of those issues that they may pop up. But, you know, again, the the hope is that, you know, you we can give you a solution that you can implement to help mitigate that problem and, and help you, you know, prevent that problem from becoming a major issue at time of assembly. One of the most common issues, um, again, if you if you look around um, and maybe some of those parts you found that are um, you know, overmolded, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a lower quality. You you may see a lot of flash, and that flash may be from the overmold process, but it would present itself on that substrate surface. This is often caused from maybe a, a minimized or a, re a reduced draft on the shutoff surface. And what I consider the shutoff surface on an overmold would be where the the point or the area where that overmolded material would stop and the rigid substrate would then be visible or essentially start. So while it might not seem extreme, when you're kind of initially hear this, when you're designing for that that substrate portion, Design in some some additional draft. You know, don't go to, to the bare minimum. You know, instead of going with a one to three degrees of of draft that you normally design in, you know, really bump that up. Maybe maybe increase it to a, a five or ten degrees of draft, which would then give a better shutoff condition for that that overmold. Another very common issue is sink, uh, and this is sink that would be displayed on the cosmetic surface. Uh, and it's not just the cosmetic surface of the overmold, but it'd be of the, the finished product. So the typically the root cause of this sink is um, is the same as you face in any of your other you know plastic molded parts. It's the the uneven wall thickness. Again, thick walls just uh, you know resulting in that in that sink. Uh, in the case of overmolding, though, that thick section is is typically on the substrate part. And there's maybe a chance that the designer who who saw that thick area didn't think it'd be a problem because it was going to be hidden by that overmold. But actually, the fact is the the sink becomes more visible, um, maybe even more pronounced because that overmold material still has to flow across that initial sink. So you know it's got to flow in that sink, and then when it does, all that's going to do is create even more of a, of a thicker section creating sink on that cosmetic surface. So um, again, the easy solution, just like your normal design, is to, to take that, uh, that thick section on that substrate and core it out. Um, when, when I say core it out, you obviously don't want to core it out from the, the side that's going to be overmolded because that's just going to result in, a again, still that thick area. 
the cord out from the inside. So reduce walls, um, reduce those, those, those areas that may cause that sink. This will help mitigate and reduce um, or eliminate that sink. Another point here is uh, is dimensional, uh, you know, just the you know, the out of spec dimensions. Um, elastomeric materials can be very difficult to uh, to dial in with with shrink rate in a tool. So, a lot of times, you know, again, you may get a final product and it's going to be out of spec. It's going to be uh, you know maybe not exactly what you called out on your print. And so, you know, again, it's something just to keep in mind that usually the the root cause of this is uh, is just the stack of tolerance. You're trying to combine two parts, two plastic parts at uh, into one. So this is is typically, uh, you know, it's a difficult subject to to kind of approach and to, and to consider. But you know, when you when you're designing in and you're you're looking at that tolerance, you know, ask yourself, do I really need to have you know, a, a two thousandth of an inch overall tolerance on that toothbrush handle or that screwdriver handle. How critical is that outside uh, outside tolerance on the part? Um, leave yourself, um, you know, I guess, open to the idea of having a, a tolerance deviation on that final part. You know, you know, have that uh, have that dialogue with your with your your supplier or your molder of kind of what you would anticipate or what they would anticipate or expect to have the final result. But but don't let them take advantage of you. Obviously, you know, have that dialogue, you know, you, you know what you can get away with. So make sure that uh, you have that open open and open dialogue that gives you that that information early on. Flow marks and backfills. Um, <clears throat> just to make sure that we're all on the same page with what I mean by this, um, you know, again, Flow marks are those visible lines that are that are present on molded parts, created typically by material flowing across the mold. But again, the, the typical root cause of this is, uh, is temperature temperature controls during that molding process. So um, if you're not controlling that temperature, then you're getting a lot more of these cosmetic kind of imperfections or cosmetic issues. During an overmold operation, this is certainly something that you need to keep in mind or that the molder should, should keep in mind. If, if you've got a substrate part that was molded, uh, we'll just say a, a week ago, it's cold. It, uh, it, it may be cold, but the mold that you're putting it into is hot. So, you know, going back to that flow mark, you're, you're now trying to have uh, an elastomeric TPE or, or another material that's uh, that's flowing in a hot mold, but it's going to be flowing across a, a very cold or room temperature substrate part. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. A lot of times, the the way to help kind of mitigate this would be to, you know, kind of run those in a concurrent level. Meaning, you know, you don't wait to to run the overmold for a week after that substrate part is mold. Have uh, have a part that's been molded, your substrate part that's been molded, and you know, within the hour. It should be into that into that overmold tool. If if there is a problem, you know you're not able to do that, or your molder's not able to do that. An easy way to to kind of mitigate that would be to have uh, maybe like a low temperature oven that you could put those substrate parts into to get them back up to temperature. So if you can kind of get uh, get some heat put back into those parts, it will help with that substrate and uh, an overmold operation to help prevent those those cosmetic you know flow marks or, or backfill areas. Now comes the fun part. Let's get into some of these designs. Let's get into, you know, kind of really what's going to make make or break the, the overall project. Um, what are some of those design tips for overmolding? Material selection. Um, material selection certainly is important. Material selection is, uh, is something that should always be considered. I mean, not just uh, just for overmolding, but for any any molding, right? But it actually plays a more important role when you are considering uh, an overmold type of a type of a project or part. Um, melt temp. When uh, when we say melt temp, what we're referring to here is uh, kind of isolated to your substrate part, meaning. Will your substrate part be able to withstand the the additional temperatures that are that it would be subjected to during that overmold operation? Um, if if you're attempting to overmold the material that requires that second overmold material to be hot, maybe hotter than that substrate part can withstand, 
you're going to have an issue because you're going to start seeing some some degradation and, and just some some potential you know melting of that initial substrate part. So you got to make sure that your substrate part is is capable of withstanding the temperatures of going through essentially a second molding process. Um, at, at the same time, you may be thinking about these materials. You may think that oh, they're they're both plastic. They're they're both you know, call it thermoplastic that can withstand anything. They're 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 natural. They'll they'll bond. There's no big deal. There's there's no reason they won't bond. Uh, a lot of times that's not the case. A lot of times, you know, materials just simply do not bond together. And it's it's really important that you go through that extra step very early in the design stage and typically confirm with the material manufacturers that the substrate part that you're planning on using or the substrate material you're planning on using is is capable of and, and compatible of mating with that substrate and and the overmold um not sure if it's something that's been you know heard before but you do have that chemical bond that is required if if needed within that part the the last thing you'd want to do is you you, you don't want to go and invest a bunch of time and, and a bunch of money, honestly, in cutting tools to then find out that those parts just separate. You know, you 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 have a good part that's out of the out of the mold and and then after it cools, that over mold portion just kind of peels right off. And it happens. And um, a lot of times at that point, you know, it, it's a it's a big undertaking, sometimes requiring a second mold to be cut because shrink rates may vary. So Again, if you go through very early on and make sure that your materials are are chemi chemically compatible, you're gonna you're gonna save yourself a lot of a lot of time and pain down the road. Now comes the fun part, you know, the uh, the the design. Can't stress, really can't stress, kind of how critical this part design aspect of is it to to the overall success. Proper draft, um, you know, your your draft, obviously, making sure your uniform wall thickness, we touched on that a minute ago. Um, give yourself, you know, again, that extra draft on that substrate part. Give yourself that that five degrees that's going to allow you or, or allow the the molder to have the, the ideal shutoff condition, which will result in just an overall better performance, better, better quality part. Um, mechanical interlocks. Um, it's something obviously that there's a lot of different versions of mechanical interlock. Uh, what we've given here is, is sort of a couple of different examples. And what we mean by mechanical interlock is this would be on a substrate part. So again, if you look at those four kind of groupings of, of images in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see that the gray substrate part has some, some pretty drastic or pretty extreme angled walls. And these are those mechanical interlocks I was referring to. So what this would do is this would allow that overall material to flow over the top and flow into those interlocks. Now, when it flows into there, you'll see that it really creates that locking mechanism. So there is no way for that, that part to separate because again, it's, it's locked into place unless it were to tear. That'd be the only way that in this case here, you would have, a, have an issue or have a separation is because that interlock actually tour. So again, lots of different options. Um, you know, best case scenario would be to make sure that your materials are uh, chemically bond. And then at the same time, you, you add in some of those mechanical interlocks, and then it's really kind of the, the best of both worlds. Uh, the other thing, again, kind of touching on the same, same subject line as your shutoff condition, you want to make sure that that substrate material is either at the same level or flush or, or just below flush to that overmold. So um, if we take a look at the area up here, you'll see that this area is, is just below that surface. And again, what that does is that allows for you to have a, a a shutoff condition where you don't have that flash that that I've that I've mentioned. You you have the ability to shut it off and um, and not have any problems. We tried giving good examples of of areas and, and different examples to to show you the interlock. So again, this situation here, this would be where you're really kind of relying heavily on that mechanical or that uh, that chemical bond rather of parts. Something that's not uh, a bullet here, but is and is another option if uh, if a mechanical interlock isn't uh, isn't in the cards. 
would be to make sure that you apply or, or attempt to apply a, a heavy texture actually to this surface here, this, this flat surface where that, that overmold portion would make contact. That, uh, that heavy draft would actually kind of add some, some surface area for that overmold to attach to. Um, going in with as heavy of a draft as you, or heavy as a texture rather as possible would be, would be a great solution. Uh, I keep touching on the, the shutoff condition and, um, you know, it's something that's often very, very underlooked, uh, or undervalued when, when you are, when you're designing this, you know, you obviously as a, as a designer or a customer, uh, unless you, you have a, a tool shop in, uh, in your facility or under your roof, you probably don't have to worry about that full tool design. You know, you, there are certainly some aspects of that tool design that you need to consider when that design is is going on. Um, you know, the the shutoff condition again is uh, is something to consider because if you have uh, if you have a poor shutoff condition and you have uh, metal on metal of that tool closing off and shutting, you're going to start seeing some wear in that area, and and that wear would start presenting itself on that substrate part. Now, again, you may think that's not a big deal, but you know, as that wear becomes more prevalent, you start having or start running the risk of that overmold material kind of seeping into that that blemish or maybe that 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 flash area, and then you start having even a, a compounding issue of you know wear on that initial substrate tool, but then you have you know some some performance or some aesthetic issues on your your complete overmold assembly. Uh, gating. Gating is obviously the other other aspect of this. Um, oftentimes, you know, again, you you may not think about gating, and and you may kind of rely on your your mold designer to to consider this. But you know, something to think about is uh, is what you can do with gating. You know, you you have the ability with gating on a substrate part, maybe to uh, to place that gate in a in an area that is going to be ultimately overmolded. So you actually have the ability to hide that gate in uh, in the overmold so you you can uh, eliminate the blemishes you can eliminate that you know kind of sometimes uh, you know unsightly type of uh, of, a, of a blemish because of that gate <clears throat> but now the other thing to consider though is during that overmold operation I, i've mentioned uh you know leaf blowers or or drills and, and sometimes they have multiple uh unconnected from the outside substrate parts or, or overmolded parts if you were to have this, you, this would require each of those separate parts to have separate gates. If you are going to go this direction, that means that your tool is going to become that much more complex because now you have a much more complex runner system to connect all those pieces together. So a simple solution to kind of, uh, you know, call it reduce this would really be to have a kind of a built-in runner system on the inside or the the back of that of that substrate part. So, given a hypothetical situation, we didn't didn't draw this, but if we uh, if we take this, if this was this feature here, and you had another area over here that also had an overmold, an easy solution would be to continue this mechanical interlock under this under the surface here, that would connect into another mechanical interlock. That would then allow this surface to fill. So you almost can build in that that runner system within your substrate part and would help minimize the, the tool construction, minimize the tool cost, and, and also then minimize the, the blemishes of a gate on that outside cosmetic surface of your overmold part. All right. So uh, the design obviously again is important. Um, something that that we'd love to to help you with, and it's something that honestly I've I've done a lot over the years. Um, I've seen a lot of of great overmolded part designs, but uh, I've done a, a lot of of maybe not so great part designs that uh, I've helped and and worked with a lot of the engineers to kind of fine tune that design. So, you know, we we'd love to obviously to have uh, have some visibility and, and help you with that. So. Um, again, overmolding does add some certain level of complexity, but you know it's not that hard once you do it, and uh, it just takes a little bit of, of experience and and working with a trusted vendor that you know has uh, has overmolding experience. So that's all I have on my end. Um, 
hoping we have some some good questions and I'm I'm ready for it. So Joe, what what you got for me? Thanks, Kyle. Great presentation and uh, enjoyed the overview on overmolding. That was terrific. As Kyle said, we're now ready for questions. If you want to ask a question, you can click on the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your computer screen and type in your question there and we'll get to those in order that they are received. Kyle, the first question for you, uh, what is usually the biggest challenge that you see with overmolding? Uh, there's typically a couple. Um, you know, material, obviously the, the material is, is the one I touched on a minute ago. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we we get uh, a lot of customers that will come to us and they think their design is, is finished. They think it's uh, it's ready to go. And a lot of times that design just isn't quite ready, um, meaning there's going to be some issues. So, um, you know, the design aspect of it and and identifying those mechanical locks, you know, trying to trying to work a solution where the mechanical lock isn't going to impact or, or cause any kind of a, a harm or damage to to the rest of the design assembly. Um, those those tend to be the, the biggest issues that uh, that we run into. Okay, excellent. Uh, what design elements do you think are the most critical to be watching out for when designing for injection molded overmolding? Um, shut off again. Touched on that a couple of times as well. Yeah. You know, <laughs> again, yeah. Con consider the shut offs. That uh, you know, again, a lot of times, you know, it's just the it's just so so. Uh, underlooked and, and not considered you you, know, you want to you want as much surface area or say it's a vent you want as much of a vent as possible but you know if if you don't have that that proper design aspect uh, built in then then uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna end up with some some premature wear on that tool and just some overall quality issues that, uh, that would pop up good okay excellent uh can you comment on this when would you use soft touch paint versus over molding uh, many parts in the interior of autom automotive use soft touch paint. Uh, how, when, when do you use one or the other, and uh, how do you how do you go about using that? Um, yeah, a lot of that will depend on the environment. You know, the the environment right. that the that the parts would see. Right, if it's uh, if it's something that maybe someone's touching, then it doesn't need to uh, to have you know a, a, a TPE elastomer. Um, it could just be the environment. You know, sometimes those soft touch paints don't withstand chemical they don't withstand wiping they don't uh, they just don't have kind of that uh, that ability or at the same time some examples i know in the past is uh, is certain thicknesses you know you, you kind of have a, a thickness that you're kind of needing that that rubber or that that soft touch feel to uh, to be and and you don't have a lot of control sometimes in the thickness of that soft touch paint that's usually where you would kind of get into that overmolding, that that TPE, because you have that ability to to really control the overall thickness of that uh, of that element or that aspect you're looking for. Okay, excellent. Uh, can you give some examples of combat compatible materials that are used? Ooh, and there there really is a lot. Um, uh, you know, there a lot of examples, right? Yeah, yeah, there there <laughs> there really is. You know, a lot of the the TPEs, um, you know, they they are a lot of the TPEs are are compatible with a lot of the materials that are out there in the other substrates. Um, generally, though, you know, again, I know a lot of uh, a lot of those rigid um, PBT materials can can kind of accommodate different TPEs. But sometimes you'd be surprised that, uh, you know, a material that you would think would be compatible and, and a material that even the material manufacturer thinks are compatible often are, are not. And, um, you know, again, this is actually kind of the main reason that, that I truly will stress just the, the reason and the reasoning rather to use um, those mechanical interlocks and, and not just be reliant on that, uh, on that chemical bond. Good. Okay. So lots of choices. And again, as, as you see, there's, there's, uh, if, if you want to reach out to Ficto and go through some of the materials that are, that are useful, they can help you out with the, the uh, email addresses on the screen too for that. Um, can, can you guys do low volume tooling for overmolding? Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a very, very common. Um, and again, you know, the, the process that I touched on, which is, you know, the, the two separate molds, uh, is is usually a little more common when it comes to that low volume. That uh, and and I guess the, obviously the other question would be, what is your definition of low volume? Because it uh, it's different to everybody. But uh, you know, it is it is a very common common occurrence to do to do tooling for even low volume 
you know, maybe up to, you know, 15, 20,000 parts uh, at, a, at a run. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question that came in, can overmolding damage a substrate? Is that, is that a challenge at all? It, it can, yeah, the, the heat aspect of it. So, um, you know, again, if, if you're trying to, to mold something that uh, the substrate is a, is a real low, um, you know, low heat deflection, you know, again, you're putting into a tool that's, you know, a couple hundred degrees and you're, you're molding another material that's a couple hundred degrees over the top of that, you certainly could see that. Um, at the same time, you may see some, some drag marks just from that actual pushing of the, the, the part, you know, that, that substrate onto the mold. And then, of course, the ejection aspect of it. You know, you, you kind of have, uh, you're, you're subjecting that substrate to, to running two times, right, or, or ejecting two times. So there are certainly, certainly those aspects. And, and that's usually where during the DFM process, if you're working with with somebody like Fictive, you know, we, we look to identify those issues very early on so that we can help kind of reduce the chance of that of that damage to occur. Okay, excellent. Uh, another good question. Are there different considerations and challenges with overmolding over metal parts? Yeah, um, you know, again, with with metal, you know, it, it's certainly something that's possible, right? Inserts, for instance, inserts are, yeah. are a perfect example of that. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned that that backfill earlier. That's uh, that's kind of an example of that, you know, a lot of times when you're when you're designing, you have an insert that maybe is only uh, called 10 millimeters deep. Um, but the pocket or that boss you're trying to put that into maybe is 40 millimeters deep. So now all of a sudden you have a, a, a pin or a kind of a, a, a void behind that insert that then becomes a big thick section. So you mm -hmm. certainly have to consider that just because of that extra extra material. Um, same thing to that other previous you know, comment I made re regarding the temperature. You want to make sure that that metal that you're over molding um, is at a temperature that isn't cold. So you want to make sure that you're kind of warming those, those, those metal parts up before you're trying to over mold it. Uh, okay, so there's some considerations to think about when you're doing that. Um, yeah. yeah. Can you overmold a rigid material into a rigid substrate? You can. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it takes a little bit more more finesse, even even more uh, research on materials because you know a lot of times you know an ABS and an ABS may not match or it may not mate, and and that's where you really want to make sure that you have some some good mechanical interlocks because again, you you're I'm not going to say guaranteed not to have that chemical compatibility, but the chances are are greatly reduced when you're trying to go, uh, you know, rigid material and substrate and a rigid overmold material. But you know that that toothbrush uh, that I had uh, up on the screen that's that's a good example because those were two rigid materials that were molded together. Okay, yeah, that that uh, so that 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 worked out pretty well, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it better to paint before overmolding or after? Uh, that's a tricky one, obviously, because um, <laughs> you know if you if you paint before, you you run the risk of damaging that paint when you perform that that second overmold operation. But at the same time, if you paint after the overmold, then you need to be able to create like a masking fixture to be able to keep paint from overspraying onto that overmold. Um, I was going to say it's a lot easier though to to prevent the you know the the overspray with a masking feature or a masking fixture rather versus trying to trying to reduce the the chance of scratching or damaging that paint during that that overmold operation just there's too many things that can go wrong with that uh, with that paint inside of a mold. Ah, okay. So yeah, so so it so it depends is a good answer to that one anyway. Yeah, I mean it's really kind of a, a case by case. Maybe that's the, yeah. the best way of looking at it. You know, knowing knowing what the the end game and, and end goal is is uh, is critical. Oh yeah, absolutely. Can you use re uh, recycled materials for this too? Or is is it does that make a difference? Um, <clears throat> uh, I guess I'm I guess you're the question's referring to like the substrate material, yeah. not yeah. not the complete. Um, right. We we actually try not to use recycled material, um, yeah. just in general. And and the reason why is because you know once a material has been processed, if you were to then grind that up and run that back through the the press, you're you've degraded the material. So you've actually changed those material properties. Um, in theory, yeah, you can. 
um, in theory, it shouldn't it shouldn't be an issue. You know, some of that mechanical uh, or some of that chemical compatibility may degrade with that. Um, so again, making sure you have those mechanical locks are are critical. But um, you know, there really shouldn't be any reason you you couldn't use recycled materials. Okay, right. You just have to be a little careful. It sounds like anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Um, is insert molding the same as over molding? Uh, it, it's similar. Uh, typically, when when I refer to insert molding, I'm referring to inserting that that metal, right? Inserting, um, you know, again, uh, right. threaded inserts, uh, pen studs, things like that. That's usually more or less what I would refer to when I when I consider uh, insert molding. Again, if you want to over mold a, a a sheet metal piece, that would be more of a of an insert molding operation. So it's similar, but it's it's different in the sense that it's you know plastic on plastic. Yeah, right. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I'm, I'm curious too. Uh, again, you have your 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 email up there. Uh, what uh, what considerations did you to determine, or should you talk to you first about whether you, whether a part to be over molded or not? I mentioned it doesn't work doesn't work with everything. Works with some things anyway. It's better just to just to talk to the experts anyway and get get a get more information on that. Yeah, I mean, I, ideally, um, you know, again, we have a have the email address up there, the sales at fictive. Uh, you know, send send the 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 model, send the assembly that you, that you have. Um, typically, what would happen after that is is you would engage with uh, myself or one of my my counterparts. Um, but again, what we what we would need is we would need to make sure that we understand the the big picture. You know, we want to make sure that we understand what your goal is, what your what your 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 definition of success would be. On that project, which usually comes with kind of giving a a full disclosure of of a lot more than than just the two parts you're you're looking to to maybe overmold on top of each other. Right, exactly. So so it's better just to just to get to show examples and to see what might what might work best anyway. Yeah, uh, it, you're you're exactly right. If you can have an example of maybe something that's similar, um, mm -hmm. that would be that's helpful so that we can look at that and and you know visualize exactly what you're what you're looking for. Right, exactly. That, yeah, that that's a good way to handle that anyway, for sure. Um, with that, Kyle, I think we're we're about ready to wrap up anyway. Um, oh, here's oh, here's and so so uh, so yeah, I think that's that's uh, that 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 you know that that's pretty much uh, all the great questions that we had come in anyway. And I, I again want to thank you for a terrific job and the great uh, great webinar anyway that we had here anyway and. Uh, and uh, actually, yeah, we've got a couple of questions that came in. Let me ask a couple more. I just, I, I'm looking again and I see a couple more that just came in. So I might as well keep going for a minute anyway. Sure. Uh, what substrates are preferred for silicone overmolding? Um, substrate, I mean, anything rigid. Uh, you know, okay. silicone is, is a, <clears throat> is a, it's a obviously a different molding operation than, you know, a traditional injection mold. It, it does require okay. different equipment. Um, materials are different, meaning that it's a thermoset material, not a, a thermoplastic. Um, you know, and it flows a lot differently. So again, I've I've mentioned uh, you know the the shutoffs and then mentioned the potential for flash, because silicone is such a viscous material. You you do tend to get a lot more flash from silicone on uh, on overmolding parts. So uh, you know, it's something certainly to consider. You you want to really make sure that you have good good draft, good shut off, um, you know, maybe considered all of the, the, the in, you know, in potentials, but he also at the same time, ask yourself, do you really need silicone? You know, is, is silicone the, you know, what you're needing or, you know, would a, would a traditional thermoplastic elastomer work the same? Uh, yeah, there's uh, advantages to TPEs over silicone, obviously too. So it just depends what the, again, on the application it sounds like. Yep, exactly. Um, excellent. Well, with that, uh, I think we'll find we'll, we'll end the well. well but I want to thank everybody for thank you for a great presentation and the tremendous insight you gave into overmolding. And uh, Kyle, I want to thank Pictive again for hosting this webinar and for answering many of the questions that you had. If you have further questions, if a question wasn't answered or you want to reach out to Kyle directly, the uh, information should be on the screen there at sales at pictive.com. Um, uh, so, so it's again at sales at pictive.com. And uh, they're happy to get you started and, uh, and get you moving along your overmolding journey. Uh, finally, you'll find today's presentation by going to the webinar section of Plastics News website. The presentation will be posted within 24 hours of today's webinar. 
Again, I want to thank Kyle, thank Victor, and thank everybody for attending today's webinar. And we'll see you in a future webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.